So this is the actual fossil specimen of Lucy, and these are the actual fossils, and it's very clearly not just a single tooth, although there are some teeth in that jaw. We have fossils from hundreds of individual Australopithecines and other species that were alive around the same time and closely related, like Artie right here, the Artipithecus. And these aren't modern apes, despite what young Earth creationists might have told you. See, Darwin, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup from your home in Kansas, USA. You are an eighth grade science teacher, but most people will recognize you for your extremely popular TikTok account where you present fun facts about science and evolution in a snappy and extremely shareable visual way. So how are you doing today, Zeke? I, um, I know you just got back from Wyoming, and I believe that you stayed at the field house of a uh, very famous paleontologist. Isn't that right? Yeah. So first off, thank you for having me on. I'm a longtime listener. I think your podcast is awesome. And it's kind of one of the few places you can go to and listen to actual experts. So I feel a bit out of place here, um, especially following up some of your recent guests. But I'm happy to be here. So yeah, I just got back from Wyoming. I was up there kind of helping out with some field work with my buddy Luke Weaver. He's an expert on multi-tuberculates. And we were hoping to learn a lot about the PETM. But that trip got cut short. I was only there for a couple of days. Uh, my family got COVID, so I came back to kind of help out with them. And then I got COVID, finally kind of recovering after some of that Paxlovid. So if you notice that I'm out of breath or having to, like, stop, that's probably why. But, yeah, while I was out there in Wyoming, one of the coolest things I got to do, it didn't really have to do with the field work at all. It was the field house getting to go back every day, and we were staying with two hard hitters in the field of evolution, Dr. Philip Gingrich, who is like the godfather of ancient whale evolution and origins, yeah. and then B. Holly Smith, who is like one of the coolest people to talk to. Um, I looked forward to talking to her every night outside, um, but she's an expert on kind of human evolution, more towards like the growth and development of ancient human ancestors. So I got to kind of do a lot of cool stuff out there in Wyoming, even though it was a really brief period of time. Before we dive into the world of social media and evolution, let's just hear a little bit about your background. Zeke, did you always have an interest in science and, in particular, human evolution? So, no, not really. I didn't take your really typical route to get to this kind of fascination with evolution that I have today. Really, most of it came along after college. I grew up in a really small town in Kansas, Sabetha. And like as a little kid, I was really interested in science. I was really interested in animals. I was the kid at the museum who could like name all of the dinosaurs. Yep. But being from a small town, like as I got older, my friends got more into sports. So I just kind of followed along. And that's what I did. So middle school and high school, science wasn't a priority. Um, it was always my subject that I thought was most interesting. But it wasn't much more than that to me. I actually kind of, as I started going towards college, I realized I wanted to be a teacher just because a lot of people, it was something that they said they thought I would be good at. I had the personality for it. And initially I wanted to be a teacher because I was really struggling with Tourette's at the time. And I watched like a Hallmark movie called Front of the Classroom, I think. And it was just about this teacher who won teacher of the year. And it was kind of showing how his struggle with Tourette's and some of those kind of things a lot of people don't think about helped him really connect with students and make a difference. So leaving high school, going into college, baseball was on my mind. Teaching was what I was going to do after college. And then it wasn't really until I started teaching and having to teach evolution, which was a subject that I'd never learned anything about. And 
do you know anything about the Westboro Baptist Church over there? Have you ever heard that name? Uh, yes, I interviewed one of them on my other channel. <laughs> oh, okay. So, <laughs> yeah. so yeah, so I taught down the street from the Westboro Baptist Church, and they obviously wow. typically aren't the biggest fans of evolution or evolution being taught. So going into my first year of teaching, I was really, really nervous about that. I was anxious there was going to be con confrontations, and I just wanted to kind of know as much as I could in case that happened. And when I started trying to kind of teach myself about evolution, that's when I really fell in love with it. So it, it wasn't before college, really. Oddly enough, I was already a teacher when I got super interested in science. So it all worked out, but it was a weird route to get there, I suppose. Well, you're teaching science, which includes presumably evolution for the eighth grade in the state of Kansas. Now, this particular state is part of the so-called Bible Belt and has somewhat of a reputation for its low view of evolution. So what has it been like for you teaching the science of evolution in a state like Kansas? So not only do I have evolution in eighth grade, I've also had climate change. So you're always going to kind of run into these situations where you're teaching something to a child that that child's parents don't necessarily agree with. And that's happened a lot here in Kansas. And most of those experiences, they usually go pretty well. I've, I've be, I became like friends with some of those parents that had been kind of barking at me at meet the teacher night in the past. Like, I don't know, you just, you talk to them enough, they realize, you know, you're just teaching science at the end of the day. But during the pandemic, I saw a big change in that. What used to be more just like conversations and like, hey, why don't you teach both sides? Why doesn't my kid get the creationist side in school? Has more turned kind of that that hateful rhetoric. And I think it's it's really because of this like hyper politicization of science over the last couple of years, where now I feel like I'm seen as the enemy more often. Just this last year, or maybe it's been two years by now, um, the local news station for the city I was teaching in, they wanted to kind of run a story on me for my TikTok account and like how I've been able to reach teaching people during the pandemic. Four years ago, I would have loved that opportunity. That would have been a really cool opportunity. I feel like the community would have been like happy. Feedback would have been good. Yeah. But these last few years, you know, I just, I told her, I'm like, look, this is going to get posted on Facebook. They're going to see that I'm teaching evolution online. They're going to see that I hit climate change every once in a while. And like at this point, post pandemic, like it's just too too like you don't want to put a target on your back like that i guess is the best way i could say it you are just kind of inviting those hateful yeah. comments and then what i also get is then i get people who like aren't necessarily even from the city i'm teaching in who like want to reach out to my principal or to my school board and just say terrible stuff about me that's not true but it's you know it's this hmm. us versus them that has Kind of, I don't know, that's how it feels like as a teacher sometimes. It just feels like there's a group of people who is against you, and it didn't used to be that way. This is Blue Babe, the 36,000-year-old step bison that was killed by lions I mentioned in my previous video. Scientists who were working on this bison actually consumed a little bit of it in the stew. They said it didn't taste too bad. I'll throw in a few more mummies before we get to my favorites. This is a mammoth. Here we have a baby woolly rhino named Sasha, and an adult woolly rhino to go along with that. But these two cave lion cubs are my favorite, and it's honestly, like, super sad. These are preserved so well, they still have the beans. Hey, look at them again, those beans. Those are over 30,000 years old, and they're just as cute as your pet cats. These two cubs were only a week old when their den collapsed, burying them where they'd be frozen and found over 30,000 years later. They didn't even have their baby teeth yet. Their eyes hadn't been opened. A CAT scan showed that they had just recently been given milk by their mother. So yeah, this is just like a really sad one all around. Okay, let's explore the world of Zeke Darwin on TikTok. Zeke, how did you come up with this idea? And for anyone who doesn't know, what kind of topics do you post about? And also, 
what kind of posts get the most views and shares? So first off, kind of the motivation here, I feel like everyone who's on TikTok says the same thing. They downloaded the app, they didn't expect to ever post on it, and then they somehow got sucked in. So I downloaded the app during the pandemic, and then when I was teaching over Zoom, it was really hard to reach the kids. They had other things that they cared about a lot more than their online virtual homework, which they knew it really didn't matter much that last year. We were all like, it was a mess. Um, so I had previously, like one Friday a month, I would let the kids kind of find any science article they wanted to. And then they got to teach me about it in a couple of paragraphs. So it was kind of them summarizing the article they were interested in. And that just, that always got better work because when they're interested, they're doing better on it. Um, so during the pandemic, I tried to kind of change it and offer the option to make a 60 second video, which could be a TikTok, where they broke it down and summarized it. And with middle schoolers, you really need to provide structure. So I was like, all right, if I'm going to give them this option, I need to make an example. Otherwise, I'm just going to get some off the wall thing sent to me. So I went out of my comfort zone, did not like recording myself at all, but I made a short 60 second video about birds being dinosaurs and it, it did decent like a few thousand views which isn't a ton but for me i mean i was like well that's not what normally happens when i post on twitter or anything so then nothing really happened from that some kids sent in some really cool summaries so i was glad i did it but then later on during the pandemic maybe a month or two later i started trying to get outside more and trying to like hike and then hiking turned into maybe I could find some fossils and then I'd go park on the side of the road at a road cut and just kind of see what fossils I could find there and I made a video or two just kind of showing the rock layers and showing where the fossils were um, and kind of teaching about the law of superposition which is just simply that you know the older stuff is below the more recent stuff didn't really think anyone would see it but I posted it, you know, it was just, thought it was kind of fun to do. And I got a lot of comments that were like, holy cow, like my teacher tried teaching this and I had no idea what it was, but like seeing it like this, this all makes sense. Like people were saying, you know, like I've just learned more about geology in this 60 second video than I learned about the entire last year. So I saw that as like, you know, this is an opportunity here. This is an opportunity to kind of teach a lot of people and thanks to the ability that TikTok gives you to not only go places and record but like add a green screen or pictures I was like this is a pretty cool opportunity to teach a lot of people during the pandemic so that was the start just teaching the science content I taught and short little videos on TikTok and trying to go outside and kind of explore while doing it and then as time went on I did a video, I think it was like a five or six part series. I think it's still on my TikTok if you go clear back. But it was highlighting a research project that I had been working on with my students that year that ended up getting canceled because of COVID. I had to let all of our control group go. But it was a really cool experiment on Italian wall lizards, which are known to evolve really quickly. And we just had a really cool opportunity because this population of lizards had just reached our school this year. And when I got looking into like what these were, where they came from, I'd never seen them. I realized they're Italian wall lizards from the Mediterranean here in Topeka, Kansas. And they escaped from a lab like 60 years ago, which is longer than they were isolated in the study where they went through rapid evolution. So, you know, I thought that was really cool. My students and I, we came up with some hypotheses. We thought maybe ours were a lot more docile. They weren't aggressive like they are over there. We thought the reason could be that when they hibernate here in the colder temperatures, it's an advantage to kind of group up. We just had a lot of cool stuff. We were going to try to kind of study it, and it got canceled due to COVID. So I made this short video series. Didn't want it to all go to waste. And then that's when all the comments started coming in. Like, you know, that's microevolution. That's not evolution let me know when a lizard turns into something that's not a lizard because all I'm seeing there is a lizard with a bigger head and some weird stomach things going on. And, and that's when I realized like, 
the majority of the comments on this video are negative and evolution is really kind of reaching these people in a way that, you know, maybe I could take advantage of this. Maybe I could start incorporating evolution into my other interesting content and almost in a way trick people into learning about evolution and understanding why we know it is a real thing. Um, so that was kind of the whole bridge to where I got into kind of more focusing on evolution. And I was always interested in human evolution. So that just came, became like a really organic niche for me, talking about human evolution on there. The evolution videos don't tend to do great. Every once in a while, I'll go off and go. I had one go viral a while back that was all about like whale evolution and the whale hands, which funnily enough, that got me banned. And I had a permanent ban for a while, hmm. which some people like went up the chain at TikTok and got me unbanned. Um, but that just kind of shows the wow. The, uh, the anger a video about evolution can cause, you know, that must have had a lot of reports to get me banned, like with a serious permanent ban out of nowhere. But the videos that tend to do really well are when I'm just kind of like looking at different science websites and stuff. And I see something I'm like, oh, that's interesting to me. Let's make a short video on that. So I think my best one was about the Saiga antelope population and just kind of how mm -hmm. it's fluctuated over time. And that one got almost 5 million views. And then my second highest one was recorded at a Topeka CVS parking lot. Right. And it was just me narrating the kill deer, which is the type of bird we have here. And it's a really cool kind of motherly oh, yes. instinct to try to trick people to get away from their nest. So I was just like narrating that and teaching about it. And it did really well. And then a video about a car wreck when a truck was hauling a bunch of hagfish and why that resulted in the street being covered in this mucus and slime, like <laughs> just strange stuff like that, where you can take a really odd story and then kind of sneak the science into it. That's really kind of what does yeah, the well. science and the evolution is embedded in it, in the story. Exactly. I don't, I don't want everything to be like every video about evolution, but if you really watch every video, you'll realize that, even if you don't realize it the first time, I'm kind of trying to lay the groundwork out, showing how, you know, something came from an ancestor or the evidence that we actually have for something. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a fun growth and it's been really cool because, you know, I, I genuinely love doing this. I'm a teacher who got into teaching before I enjoyed this science aspect. So now it's like my chance to keep going with science. Um, and yeah, another one that did well. And again, this is like where you just hide the evolution. And it was all about how bats have evolved echo, echolocation. And while the bats have been evolving echolocation, the moths have been evolving structures on their wings that help them avoid that echolocation. So like, that's an interesting topic. And it's hard to watch that and be interested. And then at the end be like, mm, but evolution isn't real. So so never mind. Like you can kind of trick people into being like, "Oh, that's kind of cool. That's evolution." Well, you have well over five hundred thousand followers on TikTok, and there's no end in sight. So, would you say that your main goal of this project is to inspire people to explore science and evolution? And has anyone ever contacted you to say that they've decided to go into the sciences because of your uploads? My main goal really is simple, and it's pretty much what you just said. But when I was in school and learning about science, I felt like science was a finished book. Like there wasn't more to learn. There was just stuff to teach. And I think that kind of led to me drifting away from science and being less interested in science. So yeah, my goal is to kind of show people today that we are still learning stuff every single day. That's why I'll talk about like papers published today. I'm um, just kind of trying to get that vibe about that science is still being done this is something that you can do if you are interested in it because like mm. as a kid my dream was to go out and explore the rainforests and i i genuinely did not realize like field work was a thing i didn't realize people had jobs and they were actually still doing that type of stuff you know i thought we were past that age of exploration mm. I do occasionally see like comments on the TikTok where people are like, oh, I decided to go into this field. You know, I thought it was really interesting. 
Now I'm studying anthropology at university. Those do come across every once in a while, but you know, as a teacher, I'm still kind of like, to me, it means a lot more like when a past student I know of, because the area I taught in, you know, it's, it's not an area where a ton of people are leaving and going to college. It, it's, a, it's a hard area. These kids have really, really hard lives. So when I would hear that a kid got a scholarship, and this just happened last year, which I'd only been there for five years, so I didn't mm. have a lot of kids leaving for college yet. Um, but I did. I had a para that came into my room, and they had talked with an old student of mine's parents the night before out to eat or something. And that student was going into environmental science and their goal was to really work with Earth's water quality. And she mentioned that when we were talking about climate change in my class, that really inspired her. So to, to me and to I think every teacher that has a classroom, like there are very few things that are more meaningful than realizing that you reached a student to the point yeah. that they want to take it further. and hopefully make the world a better place like as a science teacher that's my goal i want kids to understand that not only evolution is real but climate change is real and that they're a generation with a big task at hand and like when i see a kid go into that field it's just a really really cool feeling and it makes me feel like i maybe did something to make the earth a little bit better you know because maybe that kid's gonna do great things well, like myself, one of your absolute favorite topics is the story of human evolution and how the human story unfolded over millions of years. So if you were to put the story of human evolution into a nutshell, how would it go? That's a great question. And this kind of is, it's, it's my favorite thing to talk about. I love this, the, the recent history, because in a lot of ways, it seems like science fiction and then you realize like this is truly our history and of course when you're talking about two million years back one million years ago mm. it's harder to be as precise but as we get closer to the modern day even 500,000 years ago 300,000 years ago we start to get more help from DNA and it can really really help us tell this interesting story so I guess I would start probably with Homo erectus around two million years ago, because that's when we kind of see them, not only just our human ancestors in Africa, but they're starting to wander out of Africa. Um, and they, they live throughout Eurasia and Africa for a very, very long time, making it down into Java, the island of Flores, and waves continue moving out of Africa. The next really, really important part to our lineage, though, once those Homo erectus have kind of spread out and diversified, that comes around maybe 800,000 years ago, maybe a little bit more recently. But we have a population now that spans from Europe all the way down into South Africa, and we call these today the Homo heidelbergensis. Um, and that population was thriving. And then more recently, maybe 500,000 years ago, maybe 600,000 years ago, maybe a little bit further back, climate shifts seem to start to kind of fragment that population and create a lot of smaller isolated pockets. We see this across North Africa. I'll send you a paper to link that's a really interesting paper showing these climatic effects on these populations. Um, but essentially, we go from that one population that's spanning from Europe into South Africa, and now we have a population clear out east in Asia. Um, that population moves on to what we call the Denisovans. We have a population in Europe that continues evolving into what we call the Neanderthals. And then we have a population in Africa, and really, we have at least one population. We know there's another one. We don't necessarily know where they were isolated at, but even in Africa, we get some of these pockets and our species arises from one of those pockets. We know about the others because of something called ghost DNA. Some populations in Africa have this DNA admixture from interbreeding events around 40,000 years ago, but the humans they were interbreeding with they seem to have diversified right around the same time as the branch that led to the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. So we have this climate shifting, creating pockets, 
And now these at least four different human species, really there's more than that. We have Naladi in Africa too, but I'm talking about these four that are closely related. Um, and they continue kind of living in their regions for hundreds of thousands of years. That DNA I mentioned, that shows us that around 200,000 years ago, maybe further, some sapiens were moving north and interbreeding with Neanderthals. But those sapiens aren't all that relevant to us today. It seems like those early lineages died out shortly after interbreeding. The next really big point is closer to 70,000 years ago. Climate still changing. Temperatures warming a little bit, which is leading to Neanderthals and Denisovans moving up mountain ranges, eventually meeting at Denisova Cave where they would interbreed. And we also have sapiens moving out of Africa now. And this time the group is really successful and this lineage doesn't die out. Instead, they spread through Europe, they spread through Asia, they make it into Australia and all the while they're coming across these other human species and most often at least from what we can see i suppose that's a hard claim to make because we don't see in the dna when they don't interbreed with populations but we do know that some of these populations like the neanderthals and the denisovans that went extinct our species interbred with them so it's a really cool story in that DNA helps us kind of pinpoint where we were and when we were there. So I feel like a lot of people, when they think of this human story, they think it's a lot of guesswork and just like, oh, yeah, I mean, they basically say we came out of Africa at some point because that's where the earliest fossils are. But there's a lot of really cool evidence that helps us tell that story. And that's kind of like we were talking about my TikTok earlier. I probably have hundreds of videos about just little individual pieces of that story, um, the Demonisi hominin. So I think that's my like five minute TED talk about human origins and mainly our species because that's, that's what we focus on a lot of the time. But those other characters are really cool to learn about too. But when people ask you what your favorite evidence for evolution is, you go to a very different creature altogether a certain insect that most people are not very fond of isn't that right so yeah as a middle school science teacher i feel like you have to get kind of creative with your examples and one of my favorite examples and we just got a lot more evidence for this recently with the new paper that was published but it's actually lice because the story of lice is really interesting these these little bugs they spread many different species. We obviously, we aren't the only species with lice, like lots of mammals have lice and they have been evolving alongside the ancestors of all of these modern animals since at least the time of the dinosaurs. The paper that was published recently, they proposed that lice either came to mammals from birds or from feathered dinosaurs. So there have been a few different events where these insects transfer, transferred from birds or dinosaurs to mammals and then just kind of cling on for the rest of the evolutionary tree. One of the coolest examples of this is one of the only purely marine insects and that is the lice that you find on seals. They weren't always marine insects. At one point seals weren't marine animals. They were living on land and they had probably pretty normal lice when they were living on land. But over millions and millions of years, as they became more and more aquatic and eventually like fully aquatic, the insects had to evolve to keep up. So they were constantly evolving to their niche that was changing because it was going into the water more. So yeah, today, I think it's the only fully marine insect. I could be wrong, but I think it's the only fully marine insect is that group of lice that we find on seals. And there's all kinds of little cool, interesting stories in evolution you can tell with lice. Lemurs, they got their ancestral lice from a different animal than most other mammals. So there was a second, probably there were quite a few times, but that was the second time where lice transferred over. And uh, there's a very disturbing story about gorillas, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And again, middle school science teacher, you 
Some classes this works with, some you don't even touch it. But with humans, we have a variety of lice, and that's not necessarily the norm in the animal kingdom. Typically, there's like one species of lice that's been evolving and adapting to this organism. It's kind of a pair. With humans, we have two species. Head lice, which has a subspecies that has kind of adapted to the niche that we created through our clothes. And that's like our OG species. That's the species that has been evolving alongside our ancestors for tens of millions of years. But then there's a second species of lice. It's more commonly known probably as crabs or pubic lice. And when they analyze the genome of that species of lice, it's not all that similar to the lice that live on our head. In fact, it's most similar to the lice that we find on gorillas. So what that means, logically, is that at some point, after the ancestors of gorillas and the ancestors of humans split and went on about their own way, there was a point where it, it, they could have just been sharing bedding, they could have been sleeping in the same nest a day or two later, but at some point, a human ancestor came too close to a gorilla ancestor. The lice moved. And then as gorilla lice continued evolving, that next population continued evolving with us. And that, that is the crabs of today. They live in a different niche than the lice that live on our hair. And that's why. They, they weren't always our crabs. They came from the ancestors of gorillas. This might generate the most bizarre fan fiction. You realize that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I always try to throw in, you know, maybe it was a nest. <laughs> maybe it was a nest. We don't know for sure what happened. Maybe, hopefully it was a nest. <laughs> well, it's been really exciting for me as a fellow content creator to talk to you about your platform. And I just want to thank you for putting science out there in such a fun and digestible way. So... What's coming up from you in the future? What can your subscribers look forward to? I kind of have my platforms across two places right now, TikTok and YouTube. And that's because when I got that permanent ban, I realized like my online platform is not that strong. I could be gone in an instant and then I'm just a science teacher in Kansas again, teaching in my classroom, which is still a great thing, but I like this ability to reach a larger audience. Um, so. With those TikTok videos, especially now, it's been more kind of scrolling papers as they're published. And when I see one that I think is interesting or I think other people will think is interesting, I try to kind of read the paper and then dissect it and break it down, kind of like a middle school teacher would. So that's kind of what I've been doing on TikTok and then just occasional human evolution ones because I like that. But YouTube is kind of where I've been trying to put more of my effort recently. I've learned that YouTube takes a lot more effort than TikTok. But my videos over here on YouTube, if you like that human evolution breakdown, you know, just kind of like a middle school teacher showing you the evidence, that's kind of what I try to do with these stories in human evolution. So the one I'm working on right now is actually about White Sands National Park and some of the different footprint trackways that have been found there. I've done TikTok videos about them in the past and people really enjoyed them because, you know, footprints are really underrated, the fossilized footprints. They, they're kind of seen as bland, but you can get really good trackways that illustrate a really cool story from history. And that's kind of what my next video is going to hopefully be about. So do you think, Zeke, going forward that uh, social media platforms like TikTok and whatever comes next will make people even more informed than they are now? That's a really good question, and I don't think there's an easy answer. I think it has the ability to make people more informed, but at the same time, just as people are trying to educate people on YouTube and on these other platforms with honest science, other people have kind of found this way in to try to do the opposite and try to maybe spread their more dangerous ideas sometimes, maybe just more disinformation at times. Um, I feel like for every person trying to teach evolution to people online, there's someone trying to teach why evolution is a hoax. 
So it's I like think ten it, to one, isn't it? They they they're a more vocal minority. So it seems like there's a lot of it out there, but it's just in in many cases, I think they uh, they have multiple accounts and they just um, you know carpet bombing really, don't you think? For sure, it's not something I want to do too much time on, like on my YouTube channel. But I did do a recent debunking one on a creator who, for years now, has been putting out videos um, that cast doubt on the science and that spread really really dangerous ideas about superiority among different groups of people and I did a video kind of exposing it honestly I played his own words so I wasn't like twisting his words or anything I just would play 20 seconds at a time or so and explain one yep. that he was lying or how he was misleading because sometimes it's not always lies it's just if you're a, if you're a pretty smart person you can twist words around and when I made that video I mean you can go look at my channel right now and go to the comments it took until another really good creator North O2 published my video on kind of his community page to get some people seeing it that it really made a difference for because the majority of the comments are just people who claim to have watched it and then just are lashing out against me. So it's that really, really defensive mindset, I suppose. And my hope is that we can reach, and we as in the people trying to put out good, honest content, can reach the people that aren't necessarily clear over there on the extreme side. Maybe the people who are more towards the middle, we can pull them over and kind of try to turn the tide that way. Because like even on TikTok, there's accounts way bigger than me that post all kinds of like, last year they posted a giant tooth they bought on eBay and they were gonna do all of this science to like prove that this was a giant living in the Americas. And I, 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 I stitched him really quick and I showed him a bison tooth and showed him that he was holding a cow tooth but again, his million viewers don't care. He's, he's stitched my video one time. I did a video on the Ashfall Fossil Beds, which is a really cool site in Nebraska. Um, and he stitched it to all of his followers, explaining that it was actually evidence of the flood. If they want to believe him, they're going to. So just try to get the people in the middle, I guess. Zeke Darwin, thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much for having me on. It means a lot. It's really cool. I watch your show. I've seen your guests. They are really important people getting out in the world and making these discoveries that I then try to spread to the general public. So I don't necessarily know that I belong here, but I appreciate you inviting me on, and I hope your viewers kind of appreciated the perspective of a normal middle school science teacher. No, you definitely belong here. 